Are we going? Welcome back. Family Bible time again. And we're still in Judges. I managed to say it right today. Okay. Not Joshua. Judges. Judges chapter 10, 11 and 12. We're going to need God's help. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this spiritual food. Thank you that you give us so much that we, we don't deserve, Lord. We we praise you. We pray that we would do what is good with your word, that the, the truth that you teach us, that we would hold it in our minds and meditate on it and not forget it quickly, Lord. We pray that you would um, help us to to keep these things ready on our tongues so that we might be able to answer temptation. Uh, so we pray for your blessing. Help us to understand it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. After Abimelech, this is chapter 10 in Judges. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel Tola, the son of Pua, son of Dodo, he's extinct, a man of Issachar, and he lived at Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim, and he judged Israel 23 years. Then he died and was buried in Shamir. What's funny? After him arose Jair the Gileadite, who judged Israel 22 years, and he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they had 30 cities called Havoth Jair to this day, which were in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Camon. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. Wow. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites. And they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For eighteen years they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, we've sinned against you because we've forsaken our God and have served the Baals. Seems like the Baals are this is almost like a general title for the various different gods. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Am Amorites and from the Ammonites and from the Philistines, the Sidonians also, and the Amalekites and the Moanites? Maonites, and, and the Maonites oppressed you, and, and you cried out to me, and I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in, your in the time of your distress. Well, how can they save them? Because they're no gods, are they? They're not gods, these false gods. And do you think the people of Israel really knew that? Of course they did. Verse 15. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, We've sinned. Do, do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And he, that's the Lord, became impatient over the misery of Israel. What does that mean? It means he, he was sad. He, he wasn't going to let it go on and on. Their, their sufferings, when, when they put away their foreign gods and they truly repented and served the Lord, 
then he was concerned about all their sufferings and didn't want their sufferings to continue. Isn't God merciful? Mm. You'd think he'd just say, tough. But he's not like that. God is very gracious and compassionate, isn't he? Then the Ammonites were called to arms and they encamped in Gilgal and the people of Israel came together and they encamped at Mizpah and the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Now, this is chapter 11 now, now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when the wife wife's sons grew up when his wife's sons grew up they drove Jephthah out and said to him you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house for you're the son of another woman then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob or Tob and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him so now he's a mighty warrior with a bunch of worthless fellows mm -hmm. Worthless fellows, that's a good description, isn't it? Um, probably not best to use it when you're in the park to describe the young people that gather around there, but it's a good description of, um, of some, some types of people. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel, and... When the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader that we may fight the Ammonites. Suddenly they want a mighty warrior, don't they? Mm -hmm. They kicked him out before. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you're in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we've turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight with the Ammonites to be our, and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight with the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be witness between us if we do not do as, we, as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah, some kind of religious ceremony where he became their leader. Oh dear, now was Jephthah a good guy to make leader? He, w he was the guy that gathered worthless fellows around him and was a mighty warrior. But this is the book of Judges. This is a mess, okay? So uh, all the time we're not looking to the book of Judges for examples um, of, of wonderful lives we do look to the book of Judges for examples of God's wonderful mercy and compassion, even blessing and saving his people in the middle of their mess. Um, but this is a mess. Now, verse 12. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said, What have you against me that you have come to me to fight against my land? And the king of the Ammonites answered, answered the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel, on coming up from Egypt, took away my land, from the Arnon to, to the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Now therefore restore it peaceably. And Jephthah sent, again sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. But when they came up from Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Israel then sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please let us pass through your land. 
But the king of Edom would not listen. And they sent also to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained at Kadesh. Then they journeyed through the wilderness and went around the land of Edom and the land of Moab, and arrived on the east side of the, of the land of Moab and camped on the other side of the Arnon. But they did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was the boundary of Moab. Israel then sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, Please let us pass through your land and to our country. But Sion did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sion gathered all his people together and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. And the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sion and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. They, and they took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. So then the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And are you to take possession of them? Will you not possess what Chemosh, your God, gives you to possess? Possess? And all that the Lord our God has dispossessed before us, we will possess. Now, if now are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever contend against Israel, or did he ever go to war with them? While Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages, and in Aror and its villages, and in all the cities that are in, on the banks of the Arnon, three hundred years. Why did you not deliver them within that time? I therefore have not sinned against you, and you do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. But the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. Now in all of that, you said, what, what do you think about what Jephthah said? Do you think Jephthah had been reading the book of Numbers? Well, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, he's kind of, re and this is like 300 years later, but um, he is reading the history and he's saying, uh uh, you're wrong. This is something God gave us. And your God, Chemosh, um, uh, you'll have to look to, to your God to dispossess us <laughs> because our God dispossessed you and the Am Am Amorites and so it's kind of a um, a gauntlet that's been thrown down this is a challenge isn't it that Jephthah gave to the Amorites to Ammonites to say um, okay you think you can kick us out you're doing wrong our God is is the one who gave us this land and um, if you think you've got a stronger God um, then we'll see <laughs> it's quite interesting isn't it so at that point what do you say oh good on you Japheth um, he's got a bit of courage and and uh, he's willing to stick up for what the Israelites have inherited from the Lord but is Japheth a good example to follow or well, maybe in his courage yes verse 29 says then the spirit of the Lord was upon Japheth and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites so he's, he's getting ready to go to war and you say, well, that's, that's good, that's courage. And the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. It doesn't mean he became a true believer, but it means that, that God strengthened him by the Spirit to do what God wanted him to do. But now look at what he does next. This is just foolishness. Verse 30. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then 
whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return, it, when I re in, return in peace from the Ammonites, shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Do you remember this story? Do you remember what came out of the door of his house? Are you worried that I'm going to make a vow like this? <laughs> I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I promise. I'm not going to make any stupid vows like this. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand, and he struck them from Aror to the neighborhood of Minith, um, 20 cities, and as far as abel Keramim with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came, home, came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. Maybe he was planning on getting rid of his wife. <laughs> never, never thought of that. <laughs> Not never thought of getting rid of you like that. But I never thought that Jephthah was planning to get rid of his wife. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Um, anyway. Out comes his daughter, and as soon as he saw her, verse 35, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low and have become the cause of great trouble to me. It's, the guy still can't blame himself, can he? There are some men like this. Don't marry one. People who just can't take the blame for their own stupid actions. Um... It's really, really sad, isn't it? So his daughter comes out and he says, Oh no, you've brought me very low. You've become the cause of great trouble to me. For I've opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies on the Ammonites. Now, uh, put your finger there, don't lose your spot. This is a question, because it, it, Jephthah promised, didn't he, to give to the Lord um, that which came out, the first thing to come out of his house. And it, if you look back at verse 31, he says, whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's. In other words, I'm going to give it to God. And then it says, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Um, now, that's a, the problem because now his daughter's come out of his door. So does that mean he's going to kill his daughter and offer her up as a burnt offering? That's... That's that's really, really, really bad, isn't it? I mean, d now, I, I do think that the people of Israel in the book of Judges were really, really messed up. You've seen that they've been serving the Baals. They've been serving other gods. And some of those gods did demand human sacrifice. Some of those religious systems, they would actually kill their own children and offer them in the fire to God or to their God and and so that it is possible it's possible that that's what Jephthah said and that's what he meant and then that's what he did okay and and some people who interpret the Bible think that that's what Jephthah did and I think that's possible because it, that's what makes most easy sense in verse 31 whatever comes out of my door shall be the Lord's and I will offer it up for a burnt offering okay that's the most easy sense now a quick word about translation 
The Hebrew word and at that point can also mean or. It's just, it's a conjunction. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the the letter wow or vav uh, it's sometimes pronounced um, it can mean and or it can mean or and the way you understand that is from the context now up to this point we don't really know what's what but there's something that's coming now that makes me think it wasn't the fact that she was going to be offered as a, a child sacrifice, um, but the fact that she was going to be devoted to God. So I favor the word, using the word or in verse 31, and you'll see why. Verse 37, so she said to her father, let this thing be done for me, leave me alone two months that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. What does that mean? It means she was going to go out up and down on the mountains and be and mourn with her friends for the fact that she was always going to be a virgin. She was never going to marry and have children. And that kind of, to me, well, it doesn't make sense if she's going to have to die. It would make more sense that she was going to be weeping that she was going to die, not worried that she wasn't going to have children. I think it means that um, she was going to be devoted to the Lord, as in she would stay in the, in the um Tabernacle. There's no temple at this point, but she would stay at the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and she would serve the Lord there, which, which means she wouldn't be able to have children. And you say, Tom, how do you know that women served at the tabernacle? Well, if you fast forwards quickly to 1 Samuel and chapter 2, you maybe remember this, if you've read the Bible before, that there were these wicked sons of Eli, and um, I'm trying to find the verse that tells about it. Oh, I can't see it. Is it verse 5? Mm. No. Um, they would go to the tent of meeting and there we are, verse 22 now Eli was very old and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting so there were these women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So there were women who were employed in the service of the Lord at the tabernacle. Anyway, there we are. Um, the, the, the only mention of it elsewhere, it's not mentioned in the books of the Bible so far, is it? But you see that this is around the same time and there were these women serving there. So I tend to think that that's what happened that Jephthah's daughter became like a nun, um, uh, not able to marry, but devoted to the Lord and the Lord's service. But there we are. Even if I'm wrong, whether I'm right or wrong, it was a terribly foolish thing for Jephthah to do, wasn't it? Yeah. Just a stupid promise. We should be careful what we promise. Anyway. Verse 38, so he said, go, and then, she sent away, and then he sent her away for two months, and she departed, she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, 
four days in the year. There we are, another weird habit that they picked up along the way. Chapter 12. The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? Hang on a minute. Do you remember this? This is the men of Ephraim again. They're a feisty bunch, aren't they? <laughs> now look at them. We will burn your house over you with fire. Nice, feisty bunch. <laughs> And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. And when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites. And the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. Yeah, see, see, Gideon had wiser words, didn't he? Remember Gideon answered their feistiness and their aggression with wisdom and humility. What Gideon said when the men of Ephraim came and, came and said the same thing to him, what Gideon said was, oh, but look, you've done so much more than me and... Uh, you've done much more than I've done. And he humbled himself, didn't he? That's a gentle answer. And it turned away their wrath. But now what did Jephthah say? Jephthah said, I, you didn't help me and I, I did it with the Lord. And that's a proud answer and a harsh answer. And the two parties come to blows. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. Verse 5, And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? And when he said, No, they said to him, Then say Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Imagine them all turning up one by one, coming out of the woods from behind the rocks and trying to cross the river at the ford. And then the Gileadites saying, Are you Ephraimite? And they say, No, no, me, an Ephraimite, no. Then say Shibboleth. Can you say Shibboleth? Shibboleth. Oh, you'd be all right. But they couldn't because the way they said their S's was Shibboleth. I'm not sure exactly what it sounded like, but it was something like that. And when they said it, they were doomed. Hmm. It's funny, you know, some people think that they're going to get into heaven by coming to the gates of heaven and having some kind of words to be able to get into heaven. Silly, isn't it? I've had people say to me, when I get to, when I get to the heaven, when I get to meet God, I'm going to say to God this, and I'm gonna, they think they're going to talk their way into heaven. Well, don't you worry, the, the guards to the gate of heaven are better than the guards at the ford. And there, there's not going to be anybody who's a, an imposter getting into heaven. But what's the password to heaven? It's not a shibboleth. It's not a shibboleth, is it? It's not, how do you get into heaven? It's actually, you, you can't fake it. <coughs> At that point, you're either saved and you're a genuine citizen of heaven, in which case you're going to be able to say, look, Jesus, I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve to come into heaven, but Jesus died for my sins and the price is paid and I'm 
a Christian. Not I'm an Ephraimite. And not I'm a, a, a Gileadite. Um, but I'm a Christian and I, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. And if it's true, you'll be able to get into heaven. If it's not true, if it's not true of you, they'll know. There's going to be no, there's going to be no spies in heaven. There's going to be no imposters, no people sneaking in. Can you imagine walking up to the river here, and thinking, I've just got to get through. I've got to get through. I've got to get through. And then when they ask you to say shibboleth, you can't say it. Can you imagine the horror? You know this, you can see the pile of dead bodies there. And they're killing everyone who can't say shibboleth properly. But you open your mouth, and what comes out? Shibboleth. Because you can't do it. And it's, you know, that's going to be true. There's nobody who, who's going to be able to kind of make it up and 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 at that moment when you want to get into heaven there's going to be nobody that's going to be able to 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 say the right words to get into heaven now that's what not what this passage is all about but it's a good thought isn't it this is just a terrible moment in the life of the people of Israel anyway there we are Jephthah judged Israel six years verse 7 then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. Verse 8. After him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave in marriage outside his clan, and 30 daughters he brought in from outside for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then Ibzan died and was buried in, at Bethlehem. After him, Elon the Zebulonite judged Israel, and he judged Israel ten years. Then Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried at Ijalon in the land of Zebulun. After him, Abdon the son of Hillel the Pirathonite judged Israel. He had forty sons and thirty grandsons who rode on seventy donkeys, and he judged Israel eight years. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirathonite, died, and was buried at Pirathon in the land of Ephraim, in the hill country of the Amalekites. Well, we're in the book of Judges, and it is spiraling down slowly. It's spiraling down. Now, um, I mentioned earlier again the, the 300 years, as we read it here, that Jephthah mentions. That's an interesting little time marker, and we should always notice those time markers, because later on we learn that it's about 450 years uh, from the Exodus, to the time of uh, Solomon, I think. Solomon. It comes later. We'll, we'll catch it when it comes later. But um, to get all these years added up, as I mentioned last time, um, you, you need to overlap some of the reigns of these judges so that you've got the judges reigning at the same time, some of them, in different parts of Israel. Really helpful map if you want to look at it in the MacArthur Study Bible shows you the location of the reigns of the different judges and you'll see they're dotted about all over the place. So it does actually make sense that they ruled in different areas, some of them at the same time. A um, little further side note when you're looking to see when the exodus happened, if you try to take a late date for the exodus in the 1200s under the reign of Ramesses in Egypt, 
then you just don't have time for any of these judges um, before Solomon uh, comes along and it just doesn't make sense at all but if you take the early date about 1446 BC uh, for the book of, for the Exodus then you've got time to fit the judges in and it all starts to make sense so it's really helpful isn't it what did we watch that was helpful oh yes patterns of evidence did we mention that before yes we did if you've not seen it yet you'll enjoy it thoroughly patterns of evidence uh, really well worth the money all right let's pray thank, thank you father for the spiritual food today we pray that you would feed our souls and teach us your ways and lead us in your paths and forgive us our sins and help us to serve you even for jesus sake amen so no foolish vows don't worry i'm not gonna offer you up or promise you for perpetual virginity and uh, a life of service in the house of the Lord. Um, do you want to stop the video? <laughs> <laughs> See you tomorrow. Bye.